so I'm going to talk about astral neutrino dark matter, not just any kind of neutrino dark matter at the 3.5 keV scale, um, uh, really 7 keV scale. Uh, I just finished a 14,700 word review paper on this and lighter scale sterile neutrinos and cosmology. Uh, I don't have time to go uh, say hopefully 14,700 words worth of stuff. Um, and so what I'm going to do is basically focus largely on this, the history of the signals for X-ray um, searches for dark matter, the status currently, and uh, prospects for the future. Uh, this is a nice figure that was generated not by me, but by somebody at the American Physical Society that has better graphic skills, uh, you know, nicely labeling the dark matter as decaying into a lighter neutrino and a photon, which um, if you're at the KV scale would be an X-ray photon, of course. So uh, I started working on this topic as a graduate student and uh, back in the 90s when I was a grad student, actually this might have been even 2000 or 2001, this millennium. Um, but uh, I made this slide as part of a motivation for even considering sterile neutrino dark matter in that there, uh, at the time, and even remain today, uh, there, is, uh, there are three different indications for uh, neutrino oscillations uh, at the atmospheric scale, which gives you a, a 10 to the minus 3 EV squared mass difference, so a milli EV scale uh, mass scales. Um, at the solar uh, neutrino scale, you get a slightly uh, smaller uh, mass scale, uh, a couple orders of magnitude smaller. And, uh, and this is matter affected oscillations, of course. Uh, this is largely uh, vacuum. And then there's this uh, 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 odd one out, which is at the EV scale. And with this um, three different mass scales, this is a uh, accelerator based searches for neutrino oscillations, first indicated of neutrino oscillations potentially by the Los Alamos uh, liquid scintillator neutrino detector, which sees things at the 30 uh, meter scale uh, of seeing uh, uh, muon neutrinos converting to electron neutrinos. So uh, three different mass scales, that means you have to have more than three uh, different neutrinos in order to produce three different mass scales. So you have to have a fourth neutrino and um, it would have to be sterile because of uh, um, uh, um, it would have to be sterile just from particle physics. Okay. Now uh, people, you know, uh, uh, think well, yeah, okay, so you're motivated by LS and D and LS and D is wrong, so just forget about sterile neutrinos altogether. Okay. And this, is, this kind of uh, misnomer has come about a cup in a m number of different ways. Um, so, you know, I just tol told you that uh, LS and D is an EV scale, and that's the scale that would be associated with the sterile neutrino. It's very different from what you need for dark matter, which is at the KEV scale. And actually, in the simplest methods of generating neutrino masses, you really want only one extra sterile neutrino, not two. Um, so even though, you know, Part of the interest in sterile neutrinos as dark matter came from the fact that sterile neutrinos may have to exist at the short baseline scale. The short baseline neutrino is not the dark matter neutrino. So this is kind of an obvious statement, but at an earlier Damask, we had a senior cosmologist sit, stand up here and say that uh, Planck tells us N effective is not four, therefore sterile neutrinos cannot be dark matter. Okay. Now, I, I'll, I won't say who that was, but they were from Santa Cruz. And uh, <laughs> not good Southern California dark matter physicists. Anyway, uh, so that, this, kind of, uh, this is kind of confusion just exists and uh, should just be set aside. Okay. Um, so let me just say a little bit more about where, you know, why you would um, not want uh, more than one sterile neutrino. And that is um, in the simplest models of neutrino mass, um, it's sterile neutrinos uh, that produce um, that produce the mass uh, uh, generation mechanism. Uh, they're called seesaw models, basically, where you just have a, a, a very massive uh, sterile neutrino that gives you uh, the ability to produce light masses by offsetting um, uh, the typical uh, Yukawa scales, which are hopefully of order one. Then you can get um, uh, this kind of seesaw mechanism that suppresses the light, sterile, the light uh, active neutrino masses. And it works out, and this is, you know, kind of the modern versions of these, this kind of uh, seesaw model. They're not exactly not, ex you know, depends on who you ask what a seesaw model means, but basically it's using the same kind of mechanism to, um, to introduce neutrino masses. This was done, for instance, by Andre de Govea in 2005 uh, after um, 
and he called it the neutrino standard model. A uh, similar kind of mechanism was in uh, the Sokka and Shabostikov papers. They called it the neutrino minimal standard model. I don't know how much more minimal you can get than the standard model, but that's what they called it. So basically, you need something like two massive sterile neutrinos to produce the mass difference scales for the atmospheric and solar scales. And then uh, you just kind of, if you have the same kind of flavor structure in the sterile case as you do in the active case, then you have a free sterile neutrino. You don't need it to produce another mass scale. And, um, uh, uh, and so that third sterile neutrino has complete freedom. It, maybe it is the short baseline neutrino. Maybe it's at the EV scale. Maybe it is uh, not at the EV scale and it's at the KEV scale and it could be the dark matter. Okay. So um, in a way, uh, this, so the uh, mixing angle is given when you diagonalize these matrices by the, uh, ma the, uh, 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 the light neutrino mass scale and the ha heavy neutrino mass scale. And since the, the light neutrino that the sterile mixes with uh, is unbounded from below, you can get arbitrary small mixing angles. Okay. Uh, which you're going to have, we're going to see some very small mixing angles, uh, which are possible, though, in these, these mechanisms. So his, the history of sterile neutrinos is uh, quite old. Uh, uh, super weak neutrinos were uh, once dubbed uh, sterile neutrinos, but these are really uh, just weaker than weak neutrinos. They have some coupling that is weaker than the uh, weak coupling, and they're still produced like WIMPs in that they freeze out at some early time, and their uh, abundance is set by that kind of mechanism. Sterile neutrinos, as we know them today, was uh, first uh, uh, talked about by Scott Dodelson and Lawrence Woodrow in 1992-93, where they said, okay, we have actually no s interactions beyond, uh, beyond the standard model other than the mass generation mechanism and mass mixing. And they calculated um, the Boltzmann equation as uh, an approximated form of the Boltzmann uh, uh, transport to get uh, their abundance today. And it turned out that the KEV scale was preferred um, in order to get the right abundance, and therefore it would be warm dark matter. Okay. In 1993, warm dark matter was not very popular, but by the late 90s it was, with the missing satellite problem. And um, Zhang Dongxi and George Fuller, uh, while I was a grad student, again in the 90s and uh, 2000s, they actually showed that you can get a resonant production, production mechanism so that if you have a lepton number in the early universe, you can get an MSW type effect like you have in the sun, except in the early universe to resonantly produce it with a smaller mixing angle. And in that case, actually, since the resonance moves from low momenta to high momenta, you actually produce colder um, than warm. So I don't know, tepid. Uh, they called it cool. Uh, didn't catch on, cool dark matter. Uh, but you know, it gave a broader range of possible scenarios for a given mass scale of the neutrino for its effects on st uh, structure formation. So this is, again, when I was a graduate student, and uh, they had, uh, both of these papers had uh, pretty big approximations in the calculations of the production. And uh, we relaxed some of those to do it more accurately. And the production occurs through the core hadron transition. So you have to take that into account with the number of species changing, the time temperature evolution changing. Um, and also, there's a single parameter that connects these two models, which is the lepton number of the universe, where you have non-resonant to resonant production. So that's just a kind of a, uh, a parameter to look over. And uh, so we worked at that, looked at that, and also uh, we looked at constraints on the sterile neutrino dark matter, and we found out that uh, extra observations were going to be the best possible constraints. And again, right about the same time scale as uh, the missing satellite problem being an issue and warm dark matter being an interest, uh, the Chandra telescope was launched, X-ray space telescope, and um, I think Virgo, actually, uh, uh, XM Newton actually won out in that it was the first to publish an X-ray cluster spectrum. And we used that uh, uh, to place a constraint on sterile neutrino dark matter. It would basically, sterile neutrino dark matter has a loop process because of its mixing with active neutrinos. That massive eigenstate, massive uh, sterile neutrino dominated eigenstate actually has a small probability to be active. And in that case, would decay through this loop process to a photon and a lighter neutrino. And so since it's a massive thing to a massless thing and a nearly massless thing, that photon's energy is going to be uh, the mass scale is sterile neutrino divided by two, which turns out to be the KV scale. This is a very slow compared to the age of the universe, so it's a good dark matter candidate. Uh, and, uh, but, and it's also hard to see, but a cluster of galaxies like the Virgo for a KV scale thing has 10 to the 78 dark matter particles in it, 
And for the, the signal that, that was purported three and a half years ago, um, that signal uh, has 10 to the 48 dark matter particles decaying in a Virgo type cluster every second, okay? which is Avogadro's number squared or something like that times 20. Um, that's why you could detect it in a human sized telescope. Uh, so back in 2001, I made a figure showing uh, the Virgo cluster observations, uh, showing that if you had a, a 4 keV sterile neutrino, dotal sterile neutrino, it would be hard to, you know, you'd have to use some statistics to, to see if you, this is not uh, allowed by the data. But a 5 keV sterile neutrino with a 2.5 keV uh, photon would be a whopping line, and therefore you place a constraint. And this is for the dotal sterile case, the parameter space gets expanded if you look at Xi Fuller. And even then I said, well, we've got some current limits and maybe in the future we'll have a detection that looks like this. Okay. And uh, fast forward to 2013, uh, working with uh, Shinsaku Hiryuchi and Phil Humphrey, who were uh, postdocs at UCI at the time, we, we basically ruled out dotal sumidro dark matter. Okay. Both from a combination of uh, local group things, uh, subhalo counts, phase space within galaxies, and uh, M31 observations in X-ray with Chandra, uh, this parameter space that is, a lot, that, uh, is the dotal sum Woodrow band in, the, in mass versus mixing angle is ruled out by some, something, at least one thing on this parameter space, everyone. Okay. So, uh, uh, so I thought I would be done with sterile neutrino dark matter. Um, uh, one of the things, though, that we had said back in 2001 is that if you have a future space telescope like Constellation X, which was going to be a Chandra-type thing, multiplied by four or five in terms of telescope effective area. Uh, you could dig down into the parameter space and back then we switched these axis masses here, mixing angles here. Uh, you could really uh, go further than the Virgo cluster constraints into the sterile neutrino um, Xi Fuller mechanism constraints which have a non-zero lepton number here and um, really start probing the full parameter space. And the lepton number is not going to be larger than about 0.1 from Big Bang nucleosynthesis and the CMB, so really probe almost the full parameter space. And then we hedged our bets, which is maybe a good thing because Constellation X didn't happen, obviously. We said an exposure equivalent to that of Constellation X could be obtained by a stacking analysis of the spectra of a number of similar clusters, okay, which had actually been done to look for rare atomic processes uh, before that. And um, so uh, that's exactly what was done uh, uh, in 2014, uh, published by Esther Bobol, Maxim Markovich, and collaborators. They stacked 73 clusters with a, uh, uh, in one of their samples with a six megasecond observation, and they see an unidentified three and a half keV line, um, uh, which was very exciting, right? Maybe it's uh, maybe it's dark matter. So the first thing I did was I plotted it on our exclusion plot and it just sat right there at the edge of the exclusion. Okay. Um, and they'd actually cited our paper but didn't, didn't include our curve in the plots and uh, it's because they were a little bit rushed in getting it out because this one was actually upcoming as well. Um, there were some leaks uh, of the analysis and uh, Alexei Bjarsky and company independently started looking at, uh, at, at XMM Newton data and saw it in Andromeda as well as Perseus uh, and at about three sigma at the same energy. They waited to see the uh, first paper because they didn't know actually what, they knew that they saw a signal um, in Perseus and stack clusters, but they did not know at what energy. Uh, so they didn't want to, with a three sigma, you're not as confident that you, you see something real, right? All right, so um, in the stacked analysis, it was four to five sigma. So originally, right away, Bobo and company uh, did a pretty thorough analysis of the potential uh, contribution of metal lines. Potassium, argon, a, a few transitions of potassium that could contribute. And the uh, flux that was detected is up here. And the, uh, the flux of any of these processes of uh, uh, atomic transitions are all significantly lower than the, than the detection. Okay. The best that can do this is argon, it turned out. This one, which is a factor of a few off, potassium was a factor of 20 or more off. So if you have an increased abundance of potassium by a factor of 20 greater than solar, maybe that's what you're seeing, but it, and that kind of abundance was never seen in a cluster. Uh, they also ruled out argon because that uh, is a dual recombination line that has a partner that's 100 times brighter that's, uh, that's constrained. So another thing that came up after the detection was the uh, potential of charge exchange lines. This would be actually uh, um, charge exchange from um, hydrogen that is uh, capturing onto a sulfur. 
uh, atom in there. Uh, this is a kind of a, a you know undergraduate quantum mechanics problem almost to do, and that's originally this was done by uh, just calculations, but then it was measured in the lab. And they see that the charge exchange uh, process exists. They don't know its strength in a plasma, but it exists at about this, this energy, 3.44 or 3.47 keV. Note the identify, unidentified line is a few sigma away from the charge exchange line. So it's not uh, necessarily a good descriptor in terms of its energy. Although once you put a new line into the fit, it could shift the continuum and then new other things can happen. But it hasn't been shown that charge exchange is a is a, is a clean explanation for the feature. We were really, really excited. Uh, um, was it two, a year and a half ago? Uh, uh, where Hitomi was launched uh, on February 17th of 2016. Uh, and it was going to be the future of X-ray astronomy, using microcalorimeters to get the kind of energy resolution that Constellation X would have had, and actually Chandra would have, ha would have had if it wasn't descoped. Um, and they lost the satellite uh, about a month after launch. Um, uh, the good thing is that there's a NASA plan to build a print, uh, uh, the soft X-ray spectrometer for uh, Hitomi 2, Asteroid H2, now called X-Arm or CHARM, and it's planned to be launched in March of 2021. This was originally announced on in 10th of February 2017 by Twitter uh, at a meeting uh, Royal Astronomic uh, Society meeting in the UK um, uh, before it was announced by NASA, interestingly. So, but the beauty of uh, something like uh, CHARM or Hitomi is that it has resolved X-ray spectroscopy. It's unbelievable, right? You can see the width of the lines uh, from uh, the astrophysical processes and not, by the, not limited by the telescope itself. And so uh, the energy resolution is about a factor of 50 better. Hitomi had a few days of data before uh, it went out of, of um, Perseus. They did not see the line, but it doesn't mean that they should have seen the line. And I'll show you why in a bit. Uh, they didn't see the line at the brightness that it was seen by the MOS X, uh, soft X-ray spectrometer uh, field of view um, by, by XMM Newton. The stacked observations, that flux is down here. So this is the line flux versus energy. Uh, the stacked observations are down here. Perseus is up here. Perseus seems to be anomalously high. And also lower energy. Note 3.47 keV. So maybe that's uh, something to do with charge exchange. Uh, it's not clear. The stacked observations sit up here. So uh, another thing that was uh, a new way of using X-ray uh, telescopes was uh, um, uh, using New Star in new and interesting ways. Um, and this is definitely has a Caltech JPL connection here. Uh, uh, the first analysis is actually by a European group led by Neuronov uh, that saw in the deep field uh, observations by New Star an 11 sigma 3.5 keV line, which is it was actually consistent with the dark matter decay, in th uh, dark matter density within the field of view. Quite interesting, but they still said it's probably instrumental because at that energy, it's very not well understood what's going on with New Star. Uh, uh, Shirsten Perez and company. Uh, looked at the galactic center observations of um, a new star, and they're basically using zero bounce photons. These are photons that were actually not supposed to hit, hit the detector um, if there was uh, shielding, but you get a huge field of view, 37 square degrees aperture, so it's actually a, a great way to use that telescope to see the deep field. And then, um, uh, in, uh, a little bit later, there were uh, uh, an observation or an analysis of the Chandra deep fields of an analysis that I was uh, parallel to one that I did in 2006, but with 10 megaseconds of data, they looked at the Chandra deep fields and actually see a 3.5 keV line at 10 megaseconds. Again, consistent with the dark matter in the field of view of the observation. So there's been a, and this is just this year, so um, there's been like a, um, a kind of a long history of this, right? And they actually rule out charge exchange and argon lines due to the lack of the partner lines that would be associated with those. Um, uh, again, you probably wouldn't have a 3.5 keV transition in a half a keV type plasma that's around the Milky Way. Uh, but, but nonetheless, you can just say, say that that is there, then the partner lines would be bright as well. So this is the status. Um, this is the uh, uh, long review paper, if you're so interested. Uh, this is all of the constraints that exist. There's constraints from HAO, constraints from Fermi's GBM, New Star sits here, uh, dwarf and N31 limits. And this is where the signals are, okay? 
So they straddle that, these constraints, and uh, if you zoom into the signal region, then the constraints are these lines here, which cut through the signal regions. Um, this is the original MOS and PN cluster stacking. This is the brighter Perseus feature. And if you just look at the Perseus feature that overlaps with the Tomy region of interest, it sits up here, which is what they, they looked at and didn't see. Uh, but Tomy itself is not extremely uh, constraining because it did not have a very long exposure. Um, so this is the status. The background is actually, are actually nine other clusters that were detected at two sigma or greater by uh, Dima Yakubovsky and company. Uh, so there's a plethora of signals. Uh, now, does that mean it's dark matter? Uh, uh, it's going to take more to find out. Uh, so we want confirmation. How do we get confirmation that this is dark matter? Uh, there's a proposal by a Northwestern University-led team to fly MicroX and XQC from Australia, where you can see the Galactic Center, and uh, expose microcalorimeter uh, CCDs uh, to the to uh, either exactly in the galactic center or just offset. Um, uh, XQC, uh, MicroX actually used tra uh, transition as sensors for the spectrometry. And uh, they would see the 3.5 kV line uh, at, uh, at some significance if it's there, even with just a few minute exposure. Uh, and this is all because of the large field of view and uh, high energy resolution. So uh, a little bit more about CHARM, uh, the X-ray astronomy recovery mission. Um, It'll actually uh, look like this. So this is Hitomi, and it's got the hard X-ray spectrometer out here and an extended optical bench. It's when this was extended that the spacecraft failed. It's not why it was fa failed. It was because of, of uh, its attitude control system, the Star Tracker, a lot of things failed. But it was, uh, they're gonna, not even going to have that thing, so this is the best artist depiction we can have of Charm. Um, it's just going to have the soft X-ray spectrometer and the soft X-ray imager. Um, and uh, there was supposed to be a decision in June. I don't know if anybody knows when it happened in June, but uh, I haven't heard much. Hopefully it's still on track. Um, so this is the kind of thing that you could do with a megasecond exposure of Perseus as opposed to a, a day or two. Um, and you could see the width of the, of the line. And this is because dark matter is at a 7 keV, very light, while argon atoms and potassium atoms are very heavy. They don't uh, have that broadening. Uh, in the future, Looking further, uh, you know, it's going to be 2028, 20, 2030, uh, where we would have Athena and something like Lynx X-ray Surveyor, which are two different uh, ways of going from the Chandra current, uh, Chandra t telescope, either getting microcalorimeter spectroscopy with the wide and med medium sensitivity uh, survey type telescope, or this, which would be uh, 50 times the sensitivity of, of Chandra with um, smaller field of view, but with R1000 spectroscopy at one arc second scales, which if it's dark matter, uh, you would start doing dark matter astronomy, which is kind of cool. Um, uh, last but not least is this device, which could actually uh, see sterile neutrino dark matter in the laboratory. This is the Catron uh, beta decay spectrometer. Um, it was spec'd to fit within this uh, road, which was um, as big as it could be built, and that's how they built it. Um, I got to visit it uh, about a, a year ago. That's me. Uh, that's it installed. It started taking data la late last year. And what it would see is uh, an alteration of the beta decay spectrum due to the presence of a sterile neutrino. Now, this is a very big mass, big mixing angle sterile neutrino just to show you the effect on the spectrum. You don't have enough uh, energy uh, if you, at the high end of the endpoint. Uh, you, you have to put some of the energy in the beta, beta electron into this sterile neutrino. So at a 10 keV away from the endpoint, you would uh, get a kink feature. So it's called a kink search. And uh, so they're going to be doing this. And it's actually going to be one of the first things they do. And they get sensitivity to 10 to the minus 8 in mixing angle. Uh, of course, uh, if you're paying attention, it was at 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 11 mixing angle for the signal. Uh, uh, now, that, that mixing angle is, is dependent on the, the thermal history of the universe. So you know, if you have some kind of uh, strange thermal history, you could actually get a sterile neutrino with this big of a mixing angle. Although, you know, it's interesting just to look, right, to see what you're going to see. Um, last but not least, there's a UCLA, so this is SoCal, uh, UCLA proposal for cesium uh, that could actually um, uh, trap cesium, which is a, a K capture nucleus, uh, and then you kinematically reconstruct everything coming out of here, including the, uh, the X-ray photon, the recoil, 
uh, nucleus and low energy Auger electrons uh, to kinematically reconstruct uh, the, the effect of a sterile neutrino. All right, uh, so I'll just leave my summary up here. Uh, well, maybe I'll say it a little bit. There's this detection. Uh, it's been seen in a bunch of places, not just the original proposal. It's actually seen in uh, the Milky Way Galactic Center as well. It was seen with the Suzaku towards Perseus. It's seen in eight more clusters of two sigma. It was seen in the Chandra Deep Fields. And I don't think there's currently a consistent astrophysical interpretation. Um, and I think we're going to have to wait in terms of an astrophysical source until micro X or XQC happens, charm in 2021, and then close to my retirement in 2028, 2030. So I went from grad school to retirement. All right, thank you.